Good morning, students. Welcome to the second lecture for the microeconometrics course. Uh, today, we're going to do a review on causal inference and the problems of counterfactual. Get your coffee ready for the second lecture. Okay, so let's start with a brief, brief overview of the topic today. Uh, we're going to, of course, review the causal inference. And with that, we're going to first start with a review on the concept of impact evaluation. Uh, we're going to discuss the basic evaluation problem. And in particular, we're going to use the potential outcome framework. And we're going to discuss two counterfeit counterfactuals that are extensively used in uh, policy evaluation, unfortunately. And lastly, we're going to discuss causal inference using randomization. Okay, so the references for today's lecture will be Impact Evaluation in Practice by Paul Gettler et al. Uh, again, this could be, uh, these materials can be downloaded for free from the World Bank website. And there's another um, very nice handbook on impact evaluation, quantitative methods and practices by Kanker et al. This is also uh, available for uh, free download at the World Bank website. So make sure that you get your hands on those two books. All right, let's talk through the motivation on why uh, we want to do um, estimation using microenergometric methods. Um, so the idea is that uh, first there are uh, theories, economic theories, and structural parameters in economics, and they're all uh, quite interesting. However, uh, when we talk about theory, we also want to talk about um, the empirical evidence of that theory. Uh, so for example, uh, there are many uh, economic theories and perhaps there are also competing theories uh, that we're interested in. For example, in the economics of education, uh, we're interested in whether uh, empirical data shows that it's indeed an, um, an idea of human capital accumulation. It's actually signaling. So um, here we can use data to actually test between these two competing theories. Um, in a lot of cases, um, and in particular in policy evaluation or policy simulation, we're also interested in structural parameters such as price elasticities of demand. Uh, this include on price elasticity of demand as well as cross price elasticity of demand. We're also interested in income elasticity of demand and perhaps uh, we're interested in intertemporal uh, elasticity of substitution. So for example, if uh, we're interested in looking at what happens uh, to the consumption of cigarettes if the government increases the excise tax and eventually uh, increases the, the price. So in order to know uh, the impact of the increase in price in uh, cigarette consumption, we, we have to uh, understand uh, the on-price elasticity of demand. And of course, because um, you know, when prices of cigarettes increases, perhaps uh, people might uh, choose uh, options that are cheaper, cigarettes that are cheaper. So we we'll also have to look at into cross-price elasticity of demand. So these are why uh, we're interested in um, estimating structural parameters in economics using available data. Uh, the second, and um, this is actually an interesting time uh, because the government is pushing toward evidence-based policy. And there are a lot of policy questions and we actually want to know whether or not a particular policy is actually effective or it has an impact in uh, the outcomes of interest. So policy questions usually involve cost and impact relationships. So for example, does the conditional cash transfer program reduces the incidence of stunting? Does teacher certification improve student's test score? Does pre-pressure uh, reduce smoking incidence among teenagers? Those are some examples of policy questions. And of course, there are a lot more policy questions out there. Um, it's actually interesting to keep track of these policy discussions, uh, just in case that, um, you know, we as academic and people in the university uh, can help the government by um, doing some empirical exercises uh, to support policy evaluation. So impact evaluations aim to answer such uh, cause and effect questions. Now answering policy questions can indeed be quite challenging. Uh, for example, the teacher certification program and student's test score. 
Now here, impact evaluation investigate whether a program and that program alone could, can, uh, can, cause, can cause a change in an outcome. So going back to the discussion of the teacher certification program, we really want to know that it's indeed the teacher certification program that leads to change in the test score, for example, uh, change in a um, higher test score of the students. Well, in particular, it might not be the case. It could be um, the teacher effect, it could be uh, the peer effect, it could be uh, the parents' dedication and the parents' effort uh, to make sure uh, the success of the, t uh, the students. And so uh, the issue here is how can we isolate the impact of the teacher certification program alone? So that's kind of like the issue in uh, impact evaluation of a policy. We really want to make sure that we isolate the impact of that particular program, but not uh, the impact of that program plus other factors that um, we cannot account for. So uh, in this lecture, one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to discuss the basic evaluation problems. Okay, so to better understand the basic issues of um, evaluation problems, I'm going to bring up the issue of selection bias. Uh, this is something that you're going to hear over and over again throughout the semester, so uh, it'd probably be best for you to actually uh, get to know more about selection uh, and bias. So selection bias is not due to just one particular issue. There are numerous factors and numerous policy settings, institutional settings can uh, that lead to um, selection bias. Um, and so it's really good to understand um, you know, cases that could lead to selection bias and how would that actually affect our estimate um, in, the, um, in the modeling. Okay, so let's start with a simple motivating example. Uh, you know, we're interested in looking at the effects of Bantuan Siswa Miskin. So this is the for poor transfer program uh, dedicated to improving uh, edu educational outcomes of uh, students, particularly those coming from uh, poor and vulnerable households. So suppose that we get a data, a cross-sectional data, for example, and uh, we want to evaluate the effect of BSM by running a particular regression. So we're going to run a regression of test, test score on the left-hand side on whether or not a household receives a BSM. So BSM here is a binary variable and other uh, factors uh, such as children characteristics as well as um, household characteristics. Now, can you think of a particular problem in the estimation above? Well, I can think of at least two problems. This is uh, kind of like a general um, problem that you know we can uh, face when we're doing impact evaluation. So the first one is the purposive program placement. So uh, programs are designed according to the need of the communities and the individuals. So going back to the uh, Bantuan Siswa Miskin program or the four uh, poor students cash transfer program, uh, this program is designed for students coming from poor and vulnerable households. They may face some um, budget constraint issues so that they're not able to uh, uh, fully uh, you know attend educational processes such as going to school or uh, for example just pay for the transportation to go to school uh, buy books uh, buy uniforms and so on and so forth so uh, the, the Bantuan Siswa Miskin program aims to actually relax this constraint now individuals self-select based on the program design and placement. So since Bantua Siswa Miskin program is um, dedicated for those coming from poor and vulnerable households, so non-poor and non-vulnerable households are excluded from this program. Now, you can think that aside from whether or not they receive the Bantua Siswa Miskin program, poor and non-poor households are different in many ways. Um, you know, in terms of um, household expenditure, household ex expenditure for education, uh, parental education, uh, parental motivation, and so on and so forth. Um, so just um, regressing BSM on test score may not allow us to actually evaluate the impact of BSM because there are so many things 
that could be correlated with receiving BSM and at the same time um, the test score itself. So that's the first issue, uh, purposive program placement. The second issue is actually self-selection into the program. Now, um, among those who actually uh, are eligible to receive the Bantuan Siswa Miskin program, not a lot of them actually receive the Bantuan Siswa Miskin program. This could, do, this could be due to observable characteristics. For example, there are a lot of uh, individuals and households who are eligible to get the BSM program. However, since they live far away from the post office who delivers uh, the Bantuan Siswa Miskin um, program, um, they actually didn't get the BSM program for that observable uh, reason. However, you know, uh, whether or not an eligible BSM household received the BSM could also be due to uh, observable characteristics or factors. For example, uh, motivated uh, parents uh, are willing to go to the post office and then uh, get the BSM. However, there could be some households who are not motivated and think that probably education is not going to be worth it for their children. And so perhaps they don't um, bother into getting the BSM program, although they are eligible. So you can see that there are selections uh, in the way that households get into a particular program or get into a particular policy. And this self-selection or this selection is due to numerous factors that at the same time could affect test scores. This is something that uh, we need to uh, take uh, into account when designing uh, a model to evaluate the impact of the BSM program. Now, without knowing or without identifying uh, potential selection issues, then we're going to disregard it and then eventually we're going to get a bias estimate of the BSM impact. So understanding uh, the potential selection, uh, either to, due to the uh, design of the program or due to the um, hypothesized uh, behaviors by the households are going to be very important. Okay, so uh, as I've said before, there could be some unobservable characteristics or unobservable factors such as motivation or ability that affect the receipt of PSM even among those who are eligible and at the same time they affect the test score. So in that particular case, we're actually running into a problem of a mediated variable bias that we actually discussed in the last meeting. And given uh, there is uh, omitted variable bias, we're actually violating the zero conditional mean assumption. And so there is a correlation between BSM as well as the uh, unobservable characteristics. And so the consequence is that the expected value of the BSM effect, the beta hat, is not going to be equal to the population parameter or the true impact of BSM. In other words, our, uh, our um, estimate using OLS is going to be biased. So let's formalize, uh, formalize this um, idea of selection issue um, using the potential outcome framework. So this is going to get uh, technical, so bear with me and uh, pay attention to the notations uh, because the notations are going to be very important for you guys to navigate uh, the equations one by one. Okay, so first of all, let d of i equals to 0 or 1. So d is a binary random variable that describe the receipt of the treatment. So here uh, you can see that it's a D of I. It means that it's either at the individual or at the household level. So uh, for a particular individual, there could be a case where they uh, you know, receive a treatment. And so in that particular case, D is equal to one. Um, and there could be a case that they don't receive a treatment. So D is equal to zero. Now, the outcome of interest here is going to be y. Now, this is where it gets interesting. So for a particular individual or for a particular household or any unit, uh, the potential outcome is the following. It's going to be equal to y1i if the individual or the unit receives a treatment and it's going to be 
Y0i if the individuals do not receive the treatment. So going back to the BSM story, we're going to be, uh, or we're going to see two potential outcomes for each unit of analysis. Uh, it's going to be Y1 if the individual receives PSM, and it's going to be Y0 if the individual do not receive the uh, PSM. So this basic potential outcome framework has been discussed uh, 40 years ago by uh, Rubin and Holland. So if you're interested, you can take a look at this um, articles. Okay, so again, going back to the notations, I just want to re-emphasize that Y1 uh, indicates individual outcomes um, if uh, the individual receives a treatment. And then Y0I is going to indicate individual I's outcome if I did not receive uh, the treatment. So we can write the potential outcomes as the following. So given that uh, Y1I is the outcome given the treatment and Y0 is the outcome given not receiving the treatment, then we can have uh, the outcome for individual I, which is Y. And Y is going to be the following. Y0I plus Y1I minus Y0I times di. So you can imagine what happens if di equals to zero. Well, if di equals to zero, then this, um, then this uh, equation is going to be equal to zero. And so it's just going to be left out with y0i. However, suppose that now di, di is actually one. If di is actually 1, then it's going to be y1i minus y0i. So it means that if an individual receives a treatment, then the impact of that treatment is going to be the difference between the outcome uh, when receiving the treatment minus the outcome when re not receiving the treatment. Okay, so the causal impact of going to college, for example, just for the sake of an example, is going to be Y1I minus Y0I. Now, discuss for a moment whether you will be able to use the framework to estimate the model. Well, unfortunately, low. So if you remember, we have Two outcomes the first one is y1i and the second one is y0i can we at the same time look at both outcomes well the answer is no for a particular individual you either get a treatment or you don't get a treatment if you get a treatment you observe y1i and for the other individual who do not get the treatment you only observe Y0i. So for one particular individual, you cannot see both outcomes Y1i and Y0i. Now, this is called the issue of no parallel world or the issue of no counterfactual. So, for example, if I receive the PSM and say, for example, I have my test score, I wouldn't know what my test score would be if I didn't receive the PSM. So that's the counterfactual. So, so for example, if a household receives PKH and uh, we want to look at um, the educational outcome of their children, uh, we wouldn't know the educational outcome of the children if the household didn't receive the PKH. And so uh, this is where the uh, no parallel world or no, no, no counterfactual uh, actually kicks in uh, in the discussion. And so for each individual or for each unit of analysis, uh, we only get one outcome. So what can we do? Well, what we can do is actually just to compare individuals who get the treatment uh, with those uh, who do not get the treatment. So that's kind of like uh, one possible way in which we can uh, get an impact uh, estimation. So the issue with impact evaluation is basically a missing uh, data problem. Why? Because again, for each individual, we only see whether we get uh, the outcome uh, from which we get the treatment or the outcome from which we, we didn't get the treatment. So that's kind of like where the missing data problem is. If we can see the counterfactual in a parallel world, well, it's going to be uh, quite straightforward. Uh, the impact evaluation or the impact estimate is going to be quite straightforward. Okay. 
So let me just go through uh, the formalization of the um, selection bias issue here uh, using this classical uh, formula. So bear with me, uh, there's going to be uh, some uh, discussion here. So just by comparing those who get the treatment with those who don't get the treatment, we're actually going to get the average treatment effect plus a bias. Well, how do we come up with this? Well, let's focus first on the expected value uh, of those uh, receiving the treatment. And so the expected value for those who receive uh, the treatment is going to be equal to the expected outcome when receiving the treatment minus the counterfactual. So what's the counterfactual? The counterfactual is among those who receive the treatment, what would happen uh, if the individual did not receive the treatment? So th again, this is the counterfactual, right? Now, since I, um, since I did this little manipulation by uh, subtracting it with the counterfactual, and so I, I also want to add the um, counterfactual back. Di equals to one minus Di equals to zero. Okay, so so the first line here, this is the average treatment effect. This is the difference between the outcome when the individual gets the treatment and the counterfactual when they didn't get the treatment. Now here, the second line, this is actually the bias. So it means that the outcomes of those who receives the treatment would be different uh, with the outcomes of those uh, who did not receive the treatment even when, uh, even before the treatment is actually implemented. What, what it means is that both individuals are actually, both sets of individual or both sets of units or both sets of households are actually different to begin with. So that's going to be the issue uh, when we're dealing with uh, impact evaluation just by comparing those who get the treatment and those who didn't get the treatment. Okay, again, just to go through, uh, the first term is the average causal effects of the treatment, uh, which is this particular part. Again, um, this particular part can be broken down into two, which is the average outcome of those who receive the treatment and the counterfactual, okay? Just be careful in there. And the second term is actually called the selection bias. So uh, again, the selection bias is uh, the comparison uh, between those who received the treatment, the counterfactual of those who received the treatment and those who didn't. So um, to begin with, these two sets of individuals are very different to begin with. So we can really uh, do the estimation. Now, the issue uh, could be quite severe. So in some cases, the bias can actually be large. Um, and so if we go back to our BSM example, the coefficient of the treatment BSM or beta hat is going to be biased. Now, the objective of researchers, um, and of course your objective, is to identify the effects of the treatment BSM in the presence of selection bias. And again, there could be numerous uh, factors on why there could be a uh, selection bias. So in the case of the Bantu and Siswa Miskin program, the selection is actually uh, induced by the design of the program because those who receive the PSM are actually the one who need uh, the PSM the most, the poor and the vulnerable households. However, among households who are actually eligible, there could be another uh, layer of selection. For example, those who actually receive the PSM could be uh, different to those uh, who didn't receive the PSM, although both, of, both households are actually uh, eligible households. So these are kind of like the nuances that um, you need to uh, be able to get uh, when doing microeconometrics in general. Okay, so going back to the issue, uh, of a potential outcome framework. We discussed that 
hey, we won't be able uh, to know the counterfactual for each individual. That's okay. Uh, that's uh, the way it is. We can't we can't have parallel world uh, to observe uh, the counterfactual. However, what we can do is actually estimate counterfactuals. Okay. So, what's the best way to actually estimate counterfactual? Well, you know, if we live in you know an ideal situation, the challenge is now to identify a treatment and a comparison group that are statistically identical in the absence of the program. So here's the idea. This is T minus one. This is when um, the programs hasn't been implemented yet. So for example, you have two groups of individuals, group A and group B. So before the program is implemented, Group A and Group B, individuals in Group A and Group B are on average similar. What does it mean? It means that uh, their characteristics, both the observable characteristics and the unobservable characteristic are actually very similar. Now, when the program is implemented, the program is implemented to just uh, one of these groups, either Group A or Group B. So this is what we mean by uh, identical obser uh, observation, uh, identical characteristics before the program. Now, for this particular case, we can't compare individual one individual to another individual. We can't compare one household to another household. Let me give you uh, probably an intuitive uh, example. Suppose that uh, you bring a basket of um, apple or suppose that you bring a basket of orange. Of course, each orange in the basket, although they're the same type, they could have different um, size. And so you can find one relatively big orange and uh, the other uh, orange will be uh, relatively smaller and so on and so forth. And so if you randomly choose one orange and you put it in group A and you randomly choose one orange, another orange, and put it in group B, then most, more likely you get uh, two different oranges. So orange in A couldn't be compared, uh, it's going to be different or couldn't be compared to orange in B. Now, what, what happens if you now randomly select 20 oranges and put it in group A, and then randomly choose 20 oranges and put it in group B. Now, here, this is where uh, statistics are gonna get really interesting. Now, um, and more likely that uh, given now you have 20 oranges in group A and 20 oranges in group B, then the average weight of these oranges will be quite similar. So this is what we mean by moving from the individual level to the group level. If you just compare one individual to the other, they're more likely to be very different. However, if you have say 30 individuals in one group chosen randomly and 30 individuals in the other group again chosen randomly, then what you should get is that those individuals could be uh, on average have similar characteristics, both the observable and the unobservable. So here we're relying on statistical properties to generate the two groups that if the, the numbers are large enough, the two groups are statistically indistinguishable. It means that, you know, on average, just similar. So um, here, this is uh, what we want. When we do um, impact evaluation or policy analysis, what we want is a valid counterfactual. So the average characteristics of those in the treatment and those in the comparison group must be identical in the absence of the program. Another thing is that the treatment group should not affect the comparison group. So there's another um, uh, terminology for this. This is called contamination. So for example, if you receive the PSM, then your receipt of PSM should not affect the comparison group, uh, for example. And this is, for example, uh, could be a very interesting issue in, say, intervention or policies uh, using information campaign. Uh, for example, oh, an individual or households in treatment A, they get information that could be useful 
uh, for uh, the child's growth, uh, but they also um, you know, share this information to their friends or to their colleagues or who could probably be in the comparison group. So in this particular case, uh, the treatment group actually affect the comparison group. Of course, if you go uh, deeper into the discussion, there will be ways to make sure that such kind of dynamic um, is going to be limited for the purpose of the impact evaluation. But in general, these things could happen. And uh, the other thing is that since the, the comparison and the treatment group are uh, similar, then the comparison group will actually react to the same way or react to the program the same way as if uh, the way as the treatment group. Um, and so for the sake of testing, yes, we're going to have a treatment and the control group. However, when the policy or the intervention is proven to be effective and the government wants to uh, implement it to other people, then uh, the uh, people in the control group or those who didn't get the uh, the program during the evaluation will actually react the same way. So um, that's the challenge of impact evaluation uh, in general. So in identifying uh, the appropriate and reasonable valid comparison group. Now, the issue is that, again, we cannot observe uh, two outcomes for each individual or for each household or for each unit of analysis that we're looking at specific to our study. And so there's been you know, numerous occasions when we see uh, these two methods uh, used for policy and impact uh, evaluations. For example, with and without comparisons or simple difference method, or before and after comparisons or pre-post method. Okay, so let's start with the uh, first counterfeit counterfactuals, the with and without comparisons. Now here, I'm going to have a hypothetical scenario, a hypothetical story, but I, I think you know, you're going to get some intuition on um, how this will actually be relevant for the discussion. So consider a government program that provides a monthly cash transfer to poor households. So the objective of the cash transfers is to improve households' expenditure for education and health, kind of like related to the conditional cash transfer program, uh, PKH, that we discussed last week. So a researcher wishes to compare between households that receive and do not receive the cash transfer. Let's think about uh, how we're going to approach this. So uh, think of uh, this particular program, a cash transfer program, and think of those who receive the program and those who do not receive the program. What will be the characteristics of those who receive the program and what will be the characteristics of those who, uh, who don't receive the program? Yes, you can think of, well, they could be different households. Uh, they have different characteristics. Um, there are many ways that they could be different. So when you're dealing with uh, such questions, that's something that you want to dig deep earlier. How could these two groups be different? And how differences, how, how these differences could actually affect the way that uh, we get uh, the estimate of the impact. Okay, so here um, in, the, in the figure, you're going to see uh, Y1 and you're going to see Y0. This Y1 and Y0 is going to be different than the Y1 and Y0 that we discussed uh, in uh, several slides back. So it's a different uh, notation, uh, just to be mindful, um, we're going to use uh, this for this particular example only. Okay, so we observe two time periods. Uh, the first time period is the pre, and the second time period is going to be the post. So pre is before the program was implemented, and then post is after the program was implemented. Okay, so um, let's start. Here, in this particular case, uh, we're looking at uh, two outcomes. So this is Y0 is going to be the outcome for those um, okay so here we see two outcomes uh, Y1 is an outcome for those who didn't get the treatment and Y0 is the outcome for those who did uh, get the treatment. So this is, 
uh, non-treatment. So this is the households who do not get the treatment, and this is the household get who who, who gets the treatment. Okay. Now you can ask yourself why uh, the outcome of that individual of individuals who get the treatment is actually lower uh, before the program begins. Well, it could, it's intuitive, so I'll let you guys think about uh, the answer. Okay. Um, and so, as we can see, for individuals who didn't get the treatment, their outcome, in this particular case, the spending for education and um, health, actually increases across time. Well, this could be due to uh, numerous things. It could be uh, due to the fact that um, you know, their income is higher um, in the next period. Uh, it could be the fact that uh, there, there are some campaigns to improve uh, education uh, spending and education health for their children overall apart from the program itself so there are ways that uh, this could increase it doesn't have to increase uh, to increase but for this particular example it actually increases now what's interesting is that for those who actually get the treatment the increase is actually way larger than the increase of those who didn't get the treatment well which is good uh, for uh, impact evaluation in general or for policy purposes in general it means that well they're uh, really taking advantage of the cash transfer program for uh, their children's health and education now for this particular case can we now argue that the difference in outcome which is y4 okay here and y3 could be regarded as the impact of the program the answer is not necessarily why because again for those who receive the treatment we don't know their counterfactual right we don't know what would happen to the outcome if they didn't get uh, the cash transfer program well the counterfactual could be here this is the counterfactual this is the outcome if they didn't get the transfer. Again, this is unobservable. If that's the case, if that's if uh, that's that is indeed the counterfactual, then the actual impact is actually y four minus y two. Okay, where uh, this little dot, this white dot, is actually the y two. So that's the true impact. However, what we see is that, going back to the previous slide, what we see is that if we estimate this as our impact, then um, the estimated impact is going to be under estimation. Okay, why? Because the actual impact is larger uh, considering the counterfactual. But what we uh, estimate using the with and without comparison is just um, is a smaller. So in this particular case, we're actually getting an underestimate. Okay. So uh, the difference in outcomes before the cash transfer program might be due to underlying uh, differences. And these differences uh, can bias the comparison across the two groups. And in this particular case, uh, the bias, as we've discussed, is actually underestimation. It doesn't have to be underestimation. You know, in other setting, it could be overestimation. Uh, it's just an illustration that, you know, uh, it really depends on where the counterfactual is. Uh, you know, suppose that the counterfactual is actually larger than, um, for some reason, it's actually larger than uh, the outcome where uh, they get the treatment, then it could be an overestimation. So we just really have to be careful in this um, setting. Uh, however, if this is an underestimation, usually, well, this is good news since the true impact is actually way larger than uh, the impact that we're seeing. But again, what we're seeing is still a biased estimate of the impact. Now, another counterfactual that uh, has been used in the literature is the before and after comparisons. So in this particular case, we compare the outcome of individual I 
before and after the program. So suppose that um, I'm an individual who is eligible for a particular cash transfer program. Now, what we want to uh, do is that we want to track the outcome before uh, the cash transfer was given and then the outcome after the cash transfer was given. Okay. Now, of course, you not only want to observe, uh, you know, me as uh, in your data, you also you, you want to observe uh, numerous people. Now, this is usually referred to as the reflexive method. Uh, why reflexive? Because you're looking, um, you're looking at the, indiv uh, the same individuals before uh, and after. So what's your opinion um, in this particular comparison? Okay, let's take a look at this particular graph. We have an observation before the program, y0. Again, this is a different y0 than we discussed for the with and without comparison and for the potential outcome framework. Uh, so just be mindful that this is a different notation. Okay, so here y0 is uh, the pre-program outcome. This is say my uh, expenditure for education and health before I was given a cash transfer. Now, after the program was implemented, after I received the cash transfer, then my education and health spending actually increases quite substantially actually, right? Now, the issue is that what would happen to my education and health spending if I didn't get the cash transfer? So in other words, what is my counterfactual here? Well, the counterfactual could be here as indicated by the dotted line. It could actually be higher, right? Or it's actually quite flat. I mean, yeah, it increases, but not by much. So here's the issue um, that we could get with the before and after. We don't know what's the counterfactual. So what would happen if I don't receive um, the cash transfer and what would happen to my outcome? Now, uh, what, we, uh, what we're going to do here is that this is the true impact, okay? The true impact given the counterfactual that we do not observe. But in reality, given the pre and post, this is the pre and post impact. So in that particular case, do you get an underestimate of the effect or do you get an overestimate of the effect? So in general, there may be other factors that influence the outcome of the program. It could be you know, due to general macroeconomic conditions. It could be due to some educational or health policies implemented by the government or the regional governments that encourage people to spend more for education and health for their children. That's something that unfortunately we may not be able to observe um, in the data, but could actually affect the outcomes um, in addition to the cash transfer program. So here we cannot disentangle whether this is the effect of the program or this is the effect of the cash transfer program plus any other um, changes in the general macroeconomic conditions or any other policies that affect uh, health and education spending. So in this particular case, we can't fully attribute the change in outcomes uh, due to the program. So what's the ideal solution we've seen uh, with and without uh, comparison uh, or the simple difference comparison uh, will actually produce a bias estimate. We've seen that the pre and post program would also produce a bias estimate because we you know, we can't attribute uh, the change in outcome just due to the program. So uh, we need to think about a way uh, to do impact evaluation or evaluation of, um, you know, policy or intervention such that we get uh, uh, unbiased estimate. Well, you know, I think for social science, I think, you know, um, the idea of conducting a randomized evaluation or a randomized control trial or a field experiment has been 
you know, um, very exciting in the sense that I think this started uh, back uh, in the evaluation of uh, MTO program. So this is the Moving to Opportunity program implemented in the United States uh, to improve uh, the outcomes of children, especially the educational outcomes of the children. Now, since then, I think there's been huge movement um, on getting uh, um, you know, estimates of the impact of a program or structural parameters um, using a randomized evaluation or um, field experiment. Uh, this is also in line with the credibility revolution uh, that um, you know, has been around uh, econometrics uh, in the last, I think, two decades. So if you're interested in looking at credibility revolution, I actually invite you to read the paper by um, uh, by Stefan Pischke uh, and by, um, now I can't remember his name, but I think it's So uh, impact evaluation using field experiment or randomized controlled trial has gone back from, uh, to the uh, 1970s, I think, uh, or perhaps the 1960s for economics. Uh, that is for the moving to opportunity uh, program implemented in the United States, trying to uh, improve the outcomes of uh, children coming from um, poor neighborhoods. Um, since then, um, there's been an in increase a huge increase a tremendous increase in the number of randomized evaluations and impact evaluation using field experiment and i think this is also driven by uh, the credibility uh, revolution in econometrics so if you're interested you can look at uh, the paper by joshua english and uh, john pishke uh, credibility revolution in uh, econometrics i think it's a very interesting uh, paper to read it's a very light uh, but uh, to the point uh, article, so I invite you guys to read the paper. Uh, and so one of the um, factors that lead to credibility revolution in econometrics is actually uh, good research design. And good research design, one example of good research design is randomized evaluation. So you design a particular uh, experiment to try to tease out uh, the effect of a particular policy or program or you design an experiment to actually tease out a particular uh, structural parameters of interest. So uh, in general, a randomized assignment is actually the gold standard to address uh, the problem. The idea is that, well, suppose that we want to evaluate whether a particular program is effective or not. We're going to have two groups. One group is randomly chosen to get the treatment or the policy or the intervention, and the other group is uh, chosen randomly again uh, to not receive the treatment. Okay. Now, in other words, now whether or not you get the treatment is now independent of your uh, characteristics. So on average, since this is done by uh, randomization, uh, those who didn't get the treatment and those who get the treatment will be similar or statistically identical before the start of the program. Why? Because of the randomization. Okay, so uh, the randomized uh, assignment ensures that individuals who receive the treatment and those who don't receive the treatment will be similar or statistically identical before the start of the program. So this is going to be the key uh, notion of randomized evaluation. So uh, given that individuals uh, who receive the treatment and those who do not receive the treatment are statistically identical before the start of the program, then remember the potential outcome framework, the bias is going to be zero. Okay. Now, because the, because the bias is going to be zero, we cannot just compare individuals who get the treatment randomly and those who didn't get the treatment randomly. And the difference uh, in outcomes of those two groups are going to be the average treatment effect or the ATE. Um, so this is something that we're interested in uh, using the randomized assignment. So again, on paper, it looks very easy. On paper, it looks very um, straightforward. However, um, the implementation of a randomized evaluation is quite challenging. Uh, however, it's worth it. Um, I find so many uh, randomized evaluations, they're just mind-blowing. They're very interesting. And 
actually it actually uh, invites me to be creative in thinking about uh, whether or not we get a uh, good uh, impact evaluation for this particular case uh, using non-randomized um, evaluation by you know reading a lot of this uh, randomized evaluations and uh, flick experiments so I invite you guys to do the same uh, to get a similar ideas on this um, so there are many uh, random assignment in practice um, you know there is this uh, school quality and student performance I think this is a seminal paper by um, Alan Kruger back in 1999 so uh, his particular experiment evaluate the impact of uh, varying the class size on students performance and uh, you know there's been uh, numerous uh, intervention uh, in human capital uh, so you can look at Roland Fryer and if you're interested in the development countries uh, setting you can look at a uh, chapter in Handbook of Field Experiment by Sandil Mulenathan uh, who's looking at um, education uh, intervention in the developing country. Uh, there's also uh, experiments in teacher quality, uh, neighborhood effects, anti-poverty programs by Remahana and Dean Carlin as well as discrimination. This is actually a very interesting um, experiment, um, one that I invite you guys to read the paper by uh, Marianne Bertrand and Sandra Morenathan. Okay, just to close off the discussion, um, so we're interested in testing theories, we're interested in um, you know, estimating structural parameters in economics, and we're also looking at uh, testing the effectiveness of a program or intervention. However, we will face an endogeneity issue uh, such as due to this issue of selection. It could be to the design of the program itself or it could be some uh, selection due to the characteristics of the individuals. Characteristics that we observe, that's a good news. You can include that in the covariates of your regression. However, the issue is if it's actually driven by unobservable characteristics. And so, uh, in general, the main issue of impact evaluation is the absence of counterfactual. So if you want to evaluate the effect of program Keluarga Harapan, we want to see also for that particular household what would happen if they didn't get the PKH. But again, this observation would not be observed, um, except we have an access to a parallel world. And uh, this will actually induce the missing data problem. And so given this missing data problem, what can we do? Well, one thing that we can do is actually use individuals or households who do not receive the PKH. However, those who receive the PKH and those who do not receive the PKH are two very different households. Or perhaps the second alternative is actually to look at what's their outcome uh, prior to receiving the PKH. But again, this is going to be problematic because uh, between the observation before the PKH and after the PKH, there could be numerous things, there could be numerous policies uh, in addition to the PKH itself that could affect the outcomes. So we cannot really claim that any changes in the outcomes before and after is solely due to PKH. So uh, a good uh, solution or the gold standard for um, you know uh, impact evaluation or uh, testing the structural parameters will be on um, you know uh, obtaining an unbiased uh, estimate using a randomized evaluation. Um, however, we could be constrained in actually conducting a randomized evaluation during this um, uh, during this time because you know it takes time. Uh, it's gonna also uh, takes resources in terms of you know financial resources and human resources and so a lot of the discussion in this lecture is going to uh, be based on quasi-experimental so it's not a randomized experiment that we want but we're going to do quasi-experimental using secondary data and exogenous variation due to say institutional settings such as policies or um, due to natural events such as you know earthquake or um, forest fires or perhaps uh, tsunami, any kind of like variation uh, that you can take advantage of. So I'll see you guys in the next lecture uh, where we're actually going to discuss about difference in differences model. I'll see you and please read the materials and have a great week.